Hello, Conan O'Brien here. Welcome to Serious Jibber Jabber. I'm sitting here with Pulitzer Prize winning author A. Scott Berg, whose latest book, Wilson, is about the life of the 28th president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. Thanks for being here, Scott. Thank you for having me here. You're a fan, obviously, of Woodrow Wilson. There's a lot to respect there. I get the sense he's not in the pantheon. Uh, at the moment, your book may change that. Mm -hmm. Why is he not? Uh, I, th I think he's not at the moment for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is, and, and indeed I should say for decades he was in the pantheon. I mean, it was generally Washington and Lincoln and Jefferson and then Woodrow Wilson and maybe Franklin Roosevelt were before and five, mm -hmm. duking it out. Uh, but I think part of it has to do with 100 years later, uh, Wilson had views on race, uh, which 100 years ago were fairly centrist, but when we look at him today, he was, he was a racist and, and a segregationist. He thought for very good reasons he was a segregationist, but when you look at them today, I think they bring him down several pegs in the polls of historians about greatness. Now, how many of his racial views stem from the fact that he, you know, He's a, he's, a, he's a child of the Civil War. He grows up during the Civil War in the South, and uh, his parents have strong racial views. So does, is that where it all comes from? Well, that's, cer that's certainly a great part of it. Um, I mean, he was born in 1856 in Virginia, and he was raised in four states of the Confederate States of America. Right. He remembered the World War, or the Civil War, rather. He carried that. Uh, trauma, really, of the war with him. He he actually looked into the eyes of of Robert E. Lee once as a, as a little boy. His first memory was hearing that Lincoln got elected and that there was going to be a war. Now, all that being said, he grew up in the segregated South. Those were the values he knew. Uh, and I hasten to add, Wilson Wilson didn't hate African Americans. He wasn't a virulent racist. He was somebody who, when he became president, really understood the South. And even though he had integration in his mind, he just knew the country couldn't accept it then, or that's what he felt anyway. He predicted, didn't he? He predicted that, uh, that uh, African Americans, there would be racial integration, but he said he said it was going to take a certain number of years, yeah. and I can't remember what it was, but it actually works out almost day and date. Yes, yes, he said it'll take a generation or two, and if you pull out your calendar, he got it almost to the Monday uh, that it would happen. He, he again, knew that um, Southerners, especially, uh, were not ready to embrace this. There were plenty of people he knew uh, who fought in the Civil War or who remembered the war as he did. And he just figured it was going to take that generation to die and probably the one after that before they could start to accept re-socializing, basically reordering the way life was run, certainly in the South. So it's a little, with Wilson, when it comes to race, it's a little bit of a paternalistic view. I know what's best. I know what's best and this is going to take time which you could see some people quibbling with, like uh, force the issue more. I think uh, Teddy Roosevelt got some, uh, he got a lot of flack for it, but history's been very kind to him because he invited Booker T. Washington to dinner at the White House, exactly. which now, of course, reflects very well on Teddy Roosevelt. People forget that after Roosevelt did that, he didn't do it again. That's correct, he learned his lesson. I mean, America made it clear, don't do that again. Don't do that again. Um, and Wilson, I should say, also always had the door open to African Americans. I mean, he didn't have them to dinner. Right. Uh, but indeed, the Oval Office was always open. He was always interested in hearing from the most important African American leaders, which he did. And I remember being really intrigued by the one African-American writer and civil rights activist whom I respect most, who was James Weldon Johnson, who I think was far and away the best writer of them all. And he visited with Wilson a few times. And after his last visit, he said, I've really got to get over my prejudice of Woodrow Wilson. Um, he is not this virulent racist that I thought. He said, I'm not sure I trust him, but I hear what he's saying and I understand what he's saying. So when we're looking at the bigger picture, it's possible that uh, when people talk about the Pantheon, 
or to be even more crass, who's in the top five, who's in the top eight that Woodrow Wilson has suffered, maybe because there's a perception, right or wrong, that uh, that he was racist. Yeah, I, th I think that's a big part of it. And he's certainly always in the top eight. Right. You know, the question is whether he's right after the, the main triumvirate. Now, you, you, you start the book, this is really stunning, uh, and I'd heard other accounts of this, but you have a great description of it. Uh, Wilson going to Paris. Yeah. World War I is over. He's going to try and settle the peace. And this is unprecedented for an American president to leave the country yeah. for a long period of time. Six months. Six months, because there's no Air Force One, <laughs> quick trip, let's sign an accord yeah. in Reykjavik and then turn around and I'll get back for dinner. This is, he gets on a boat, says farewell to America, and he's absent from the continent for six months. Yes. When he gets to Paris, it's Beatlemania plus- Times 10. Times 10, Backstreet Boys, whatever you wanna, let's pretend I didn't say that. Uh, I know you're a fan, but not me. Uh, I'll never be able to forget that. Yeah, I know. You were, you've been at every concert. Uh, and then you switched to 98 <laughs> Degrees. Um, the, Pandemonium that greets Woodrow Wilson, he is, they compare him to Christ. Everyone in Europe thinks he is here, he is this man that's ascended from, that descended from the clouds to save us. The savior of the world. Savior of the world. And that's so striking because his ascension to the presidency uh, is, is stunningly fast and, uh, and accelerated. He's an academic. He yeah. is not... He's not someone who's done his time in politics, and we can talk about other presidents who've gone this route, but from the time that he's president of Princeton yeah. to governor of New Jersey briefly to the president of the United States is very fast, and then he's in Europe and he's a god. And you think about how quickly that all happens. This is, his political rise is the most meteoric rise in American history. Um, beyond that, his rise is the greatest in human history that had occurred. In October of 1910, Woodrow Wilson was the president of a small college in New Jersey, Princeton University. Mm -hmm. In November of 1912, he's elected president of the United States. Yeah. It's just stunning. In between, as you suggested, there was this 18-month period in which he was elected governor of New Jersey. Uh, he won in a landslide. He introduced the most progressive agenda of any state in the country. And suddenly, everybody in America is looking at New Jersey because he's cleaning up the corrupt government. He kicked out the very machine that had picked him to be their puppet. Mm -hmm. And that's really what drew a lot of national attention. And then indeed, when he became president in, in uh, March of 1913, he inaugurated the greatest progressive agenda the country had seen. And not only introduced items, he got them passed. Right. So he proved to be, even though with a, he had an academic back background, he had very sharp political elbows and very keen political skills. He could, he could get things done, he could go, and this is particularly interesting today when uh, we're looking at the difficulties that modern presidents have. Yes. Uh, he was able to go to the Hill. There was actually a, an office that I didn't even know about until I read your book. Nobody knows about Nobody it. knows about this office. There's a small room off the Senate that's for the president he would stay there regularly in this small room working with senators to try and get Correct. progressive legislation passed. I think no president has used it because it's got a very tricky name. It's called the president's room. And it just sits there. Doesn't, uh, it doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's a problem. But if you go there today, it is locked. You have, right. you have to find the man with the key who right. can open it, first of all. But it was designed strictly for the president's use. Uh, and no president used it before or since uh, for its designated purpose. So Wilson, uh, yeah, I think sometimes there's a feeling uh, modern presidents, 20th century presidents, a lot of them think it's beneath them to go to yeah. the Hill. They don't want to look like they're coming with hat in hand to beg. They don't want to look like they're getting down, rolling up their sleeves and making a, yeah. getting in the dirt and making a deal. But Wilson was willing to do that. He was a scholar, mm -hmm. but he had studied uh, American a political system, the British parliamentary system. So he was kind of an expert 
He was an expert in government. On how all, government works. All around the world through the years, in fact. He was definitely an expert in this. Uh, and it's not just that he was uh, willing to come down to the Congress. He was eager to do it. Um, I often think uh, Wilson didn't really want to be president of the United States. He would have preferred being prime minister of the United States. He liked that parliamentary system in which yeah. you rallied the troops which were basically already behind you. Mm -hmm. So that was a concept that he was trying to he was trying to introduce that into the American system. Beyond that, though, he had really deep feelings about the importance of transparency in American government. He wanted to humanize especially the executive branch. He wanted people to see there's a real person, a flesh and blood guy who is the president of the United States. He wanted the country to see that and he wanted the Congress to see that. So that's why he was there often. What's interesting to me is you just brought it up, so I'm gonna talk about it. One of the prejudices maybe I've had about Wilson is that he does, he's, uh, uh, his father was a minister mm -hmm. and uh, he, I always think of him with the high collar, the dour expression. Yes. He's a two-dimensional black and white character to me. Yeah. It's not just because of his time, because there's this sorrow, there's this humanity to, to, to Lincoln, there's this incredible energy and excitement to Teddy Roosevelt. Different presidents can crack through. Uh, what surprised me reading this book is that Wilson is very different than I thought he was. He, uh, years of his, in his youth, he's, he's a little bit lost. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, he's lovesick. <laughs> uh, he is a ladies' man. He mm -hmm. loves the ladies. He's very passionate. Yep. And we could talk a little bit about that. We should, and he was extremely emotional also. And, and I think actually this goes back to, to your earliest question. I think this, is, this has brought him down a few notches in historians' polls also, because he hasn't been properly humanized. And we have great concepts of, of Teddy Roosevelt charging up you know, San Juan Hill and all right. that. So they are kind of bigger than life uh, characters. Wilson was in fact bigger than life in his own day. Since that time though, we've had to rely on, on these black and white photographs that I think are rather forbidding. Yeah. I think part of the problem, and this is completely self-serving, but I don't think he's really had a proper biography about him that has really humanized him. And that's certainly been, been the goal in this book. But all the things you suggested, he, I mean, he, he did love women. He was, I mean, I read through not hundreds, but thousands of love letters he wrote to his first wife as they were courting. And then he had a second wife, and not at the same time, I should add, um, after his, his, his first wife uh, dies of uh, Bright's disease. Is Bright's right? disease, which was kidney, kidney. Kidney failure, yeah. In the White House, after one year, he was desperately in love with her. And now here's the president of the United States. I mean, this is the stuff of, of dime novels. The president- It's a Michael Douglas movie. <laughs> well, it actually it is. is. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it was. <laughs> he's, he's, yeah. A, he's, a, he's a widowed <laughs> president. Yeah. And he, uh, uh, there's probably some bias there are probably people that think he should remain, he should wear a black armband for the rest of his life, and Wilson is not having that. And he did wear a black armband for about a year. Right. But um, he, he began courting, uh, and it's, it's kind of fascinating. And there's the President of the United States very quietly entertaining a very attractive young widow he was introduced to in Washington, and having private dinners with her, and, and uh, writing hundreds of passionate love letters to her. So. Again, all this is so not who most people perceive Woodrow Wilson. And he was uh, in touch with his, you know, sexual urges, Absolutely. Woodrow Wilson. Absolutely. Let's talk about that. Well, well, he had them and he talked about them and he acted on them. And he them. wrote about them. He did, well he, well, he would write them in, in, in his love letters, uh, certainly. I mean, when he was courting these women and, and I have an episode when he's courting his, uh, his second wife, actually, in which he makes advances to uh, this woman, Edith uh, Bowling Gold, uh, in the back of a car, in the back of the, of the limousine, the White House limo. Uh, and basically she rebuffs him and, and she says, you're gonna have to convince me. You're gonna have to come on in another way and, and bring me around, and, and he does. And, and within a year they're married and, and he does have his way. Yeah, uh, he waited, which was the right thing to do. He did. I was a virgin. 
too. Is there- until about a year ago. Um, the, uh, there's also a lot of, uh, he's very emotional, uh, and this surprised me too, he's very emotional about the war, Woodrow Wilson. Yeah, deeply. Sending young men off to war, and he's, uh, he takes that responsi- responsibility very seriously, Yeah, and makes a big point of uh, when the war has ended of visiting these battlefields, going there, and he's very emotional about the lives that have been lost and the fact that he sent these boys off to die. He tried to keep us out of war for a long time, but he's, so you can see, that surprised me too, that he is, he, he seems like almost such an 18th century figure to me it, it, before I read this book, and then I yeah. see him now as a much more emotional yeah, he's even, he's even a 21st century figure, as it turns out. Um, and I hope we can talk about how Wilson's foreign policy uh, really is what we use today. But you touch on what, what may be the biggest surprise for me in putting the book together, and this bespeaks how really passionate this man was. Uh, and it wasn't just for the ladies. It was he had deep feelings about everything. And again, this is where his childhood, I think, kicks in, remembering the Civil War, growing up there, seeing the devastation to the South, and carrying that with him all his life. So when the decision came as president to send his nation into war, he he took this very seriously. And, And when he sent two million men overseas, he realized he was signing the death warrants for many of those men. And he always copped to it the 100,000 American soldiers who died. He carried that with him. I mean, it's, it's like Lincoln. I don't know another president who f- felt it as deeply as Wilson did. And he gives some speeches at these cemeteries that are just heartbreaking, mm-hmm. in which he basically says, I sent these men to their graves. And that's why we must have a League of Nations right. so that no mother ever has to bury her son a soldier. Um, you know, that we can go on and maybe we have fought the war to end all wars. So this was something Wilson took personally. This wasn't politics for him. Now, there's a perception that I had before Wilson, before I read uh, Wilson, your book, that's maybe still borne out for me, which is he can seem early on when he's he's a progressive and he's president, he's he's getting a lot of legislation passed and he's Mm -hmm. able to compromise. As his presidency goes on, and at the end of World War I, he gets this idea mm-hmm. of the League of Nations, uh, you know, precursor to the United Nations, but let's have all the countries agree, we can all get together, there will never be another war, we can sign this agreement, all of our differences can be worked out. Um, and it is not a popular idea back home, with, it's popular with some people, but obviously it's politically divisive. Politically charged with the Republican Senate, Republican, especially. Republican Senate does not like it. They don't like Americans' hands being tied. They don't like us being connected that way. They don't like this umbilical cord stretching across the ocean to... to and they don't like a Democratic president right. who has come up with this plan after a Democrat, he won the war. Right. They wanted to say, oh, the Republicans will win the peace. Right. We'll, we'll take care of that. We'll take care of that. But... That's where he seems inflexible to me. He gets this idea and he, uh, there are many opportunities that you can talk about in more depth where he has a chance, a chance to get this passed. And his big rival is Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. Of Massachusetts. And all he has to do is there's some times where they just have to make a compromise and he can't do it. It's fascinating to me because we're seeing Right now, one of the things that makes this book so fascinating is that there's a very similar scenario that's playing out every day in the newspapers. Um, If anyone still reads newspapers uh, on your computer screen or on your phone, uh, it is playing out where some people feel that we have an idealistic president who's got an idea and he's not willing to compromise. And there is a lot of dissension in the country. That's essentially where, to me, I still feel that Woodrow Wilson was inflexible when it came to the League of Nations. Is that fair? Uh, It's more than fair. He was completely inflexible. And I think there were a couple of things at work. Uh, The first thing goes back uh, to those 
cemeteries where he would give these moving speeches mm -hmm. and, and basically own those dead soldiers. Uh, he was saying, in essence, I owe it to these dead men uh, to fight for this league. And they gave their lives. I will now give my life, if I have to, for this uncompromised position. Right. So that's certainly part of it. Uh, the second part, I think, was um, he, he, uh, he was suffering uh, from certain mental illnesses along the way, which is another part of the book. Yeah. He was having, we now realize, strokes uh, as far back as his 30s, in fact. This is what stunned me because it's well known that he had a stroke. A stroke. When he comes back to the United States, He's in a deadlock with the Senate. He decides, I'm going to go and preach my case to the people mm -hmm. themselves. He gets on a train, whistle-stop tour. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go town to town to town. This is before you could just go on television or the radio and do it. He goes town yeah. to town to town, falls ill, and has a devastating stroke. What I didn't realize, it comes out in your book, in his 30s, he's having what he thinks are writer's cramps Yep. from, from holding his pen too long. Yep. But it's accompanied by depression and sort and, of and lethargy. Lo and, and losing vision and, yes, real depression, though. He, he would just have what we now call breakdowns. Yeah. Um, and he was suffering from them. But indeed, in Paris, when they were negotiating that treaty for the six months that the president is not at home, sometimes there were days of truly aberrant behavior. There's a great scene you talk about where he's rearranging. He's rearranging. Well, you tell the story, but he's yeah. he's he's had some. He's rearranging the furniture. He's insist we all stop and let's rearrange the furniture so it's chromatically more pleasing. That's exactly that right. Yes, I wanted the the purple chair clashes with the green, and let's move all the reds over here. And I want the British to be sitting in the blue chairs, and and it's a little manic and a little crazy. And the doctor is looking at him. He had a doctor who traveled with him all the time. Uh, who said, Mr. President, let's take a walk. <laughs> um, and they come back and everything is fine, but uh, you know, now we're rearranging the world, not just rearranging some furniture. And you begin to realize, well, the, that he was having, no doubt, some episode, some cerebral episode. And you have to wonder how many of these were happening in other years. But also, we now know strokes affect emotions and just the body chemistry, what's going on. And I think a lot of this contributed to Wilson's inflexibility at the very end over the League of Nations. Um, part of it was what emotions are flowing, which humors are flowing. Um, but, but part of it, too, is you know when you're feeling bad, uh, you make different decisions. Your time is you're less free with your time. You've really got to husband it, and you've got to, you make quicker decisions, and sometimes you make wrong decisions. And I think Wilson was doing a lot of that in the last year or two. Unfortunately, they have universal consequences. We need a neurosurgeon to come in here and, and talk about this part, but I got the sense reading your book that one of the side effects of a stroke might be monomania, or, or, or where you're just, no you question. can't, you start thinking about how this mug is is black, but not quite as black as the table. And if you're having an episode, I'm just then become obsessed with how do I get this mug to be as dark as the table? And should we get a lighter mug or a darker table? And I can't break myself free of that obsessive thought. And that's what it starts to feel like with I Woodrow Wilson is. is that he just, League of Nations, League of Nations, League of Nations, League of Nations, League of Nations. Oh, and he can't let it go. And I will will it into existence. And in fact, because he was the most religious president we've ever had as well, that it is his mission. He really did believe that it was God's will that he be president. It was providence. He was chosen. It was all there. Um, and indeed, right after he's elected, a, a kind of flaky campaign manager who worked on the campaign but got ill himself uh, in getting Wilson elected, uh, came to Wilson to get a political job afterwards. And Wilson greets him and says, before you say a thing, you had nothing to do with my getting elected president. This, I was chosen to do this. I mean, this right. came from above. So Wilson believed that. He really did. And the, the amazing thing is, he didn't bring religion into his speeches and talk very often. 
Uh, but his religiosity, his deep spirituality, really informed and infused every decision he ever made. Now, the problem is that can get dangerous. If you yeah. believe that God made you president, you can also believe that all of your decisions are God speaking through you. Um, I, I went through a phase like that. I, <laughs> Unfortunately, I have good people around me who slap me around. Uh, but uh, I'm stunned to hear the former, but not the latter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 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 so that's the question: is um, did that in hamper his ability at all to be a in the one in the one breath you're saying he's a very human president, he's a real full-blooded three-dimensional human being, but he also believes that God has made him president. Yeah, and, and you know, with his religiousness came actually a strange modesty that he had. I mean, he, there, there was a humility to him. Right. Um, he's probably the most humble person with a Christ complex uh, we've ever had in the White House. But he, he was both. It's, it's an amazing uh, juxtaposition of the two. But, but he did have all that, and he felt, he felt secure in his decisions. Yeah. And I think, I think that's where... I wouldn't go so far as to say God was speaking to him, but he felt uh, God was allowing him to say what he had to say. And that therefore, uh, whether it was correct or not, if God was going to have to correct it later on, as he might have to, that's his business. But I am meant to do what I am meant to do. Um, and he was always clear about it. He was always clear about what his mission was. I, there's something that you've picked up in this book that I really enjoyed because it tells you something about him, and it's also very relatable. He was a good hater. <laughs> yeah. He could carry a grudge. If he was mad at someone, he could really work himself up about it. Um, and how did that play into his presidency, his well, life? Well, yes, uh, yeah, his entire life, in fact. And in fact, he wouldn't get worked up into much of a lather if somebody crossed him the curtain came down. You were just out of his life. And there are two or three episodes of the people closest to him in his life. One when he was a college professor and president. I mean, he had a dear, dear friend whom he used to see several times a day. He couldn't get enough of him. But when there came to be a crucial fight at Princeton about the social structure of the school, which right. Wilson was trying to change, and this great friend, uh, Jack Hibben, uh, crossed him and voted on the other side, Wilson decided never to see him or speak to him again and really went the rest of their lives doing that. I mean, there were a few occasions in which he had to speak to him formally, but that was it. Uh, and so it was with a couple of his advisors as well. He had, he had three extremely close advisors. Colonel in the House. House? Colonel House was yeah. one. And he's one of his closest friends and advisors with him all the time. And then when Colonel oh. House is out, he is just out. Out. And, and when Wilson leaves Paris, where Colonel House has been his chief negotiator, uh, Wilson says goodbye to him at the train station. Wilson then takes the train, gets on the boat, but he never saw Colonel House again. Yeah. He never spoke to Colonel House again. He called Colonel House his second personality. His, you know, I mean, they, they were virtually inseparable. But again, Wilson never saw him. And then there was another fellow in the White House named Tumulty, who was sort of Wilson's chief of staff, who had come with him from New Jersey, and was an old Paul who really ran that side of things for Wilson. Uh, but he did something after Wilson left the White House that Wilson disapproved of, and again, never saw him again, never spoke to him again. I'm curious about, uh, his name's come up before in the conversation, but Teddy Roosevelt is, you know, He's president at the turn of the century uh, and for a good part of that decade before, uh, <clears throat> before Wilson becomes president. And they're both progressives. Mm -hmm. So they both stand for a lot of the same things. And in fact, Wilson gets a lot of things passed that Teddy Roosevelt would have loved to have gotten passed. So you'd think they'd be on the same page. Yes. Um, now, during the war, Teddy Roosevelt very badly wants to go and fight. Yeah. And he comes, to, he's too old to fight, but he goes to Wilson for a dispensation, please let me go and let me fight. Wilson won't give it to him. That's true. And you think, sometimes I look at that episode and I've read a lot about Teddy Roosevelt and I've read your book now, Wilson, and you look at it from both sides and it's hard not to see 
some element of maybe jealousy or just obviously Theodore Roosevelt said a lot of nasty things about Wilson and was probably jealous of Wilson. So Wilson, this is an opportunity for Wilson, maybe who's a good hater to say, I'm not going to give you the limelight. You'd really love to go across to, to France mm -hmm. and fight, maybe even get killed and be, and I'm, not, I'm going to deny you that. I'm going to deny you that, that chance in the spotlight. Is that? Well, uh, everything you said is true. Um, and, and Teddy Roosevelt detested Wilson. All Not at first, but then increasingly. Yeah, well, and once then... Wilson got into politics, he did. Yeah. You know, when he was a college professor and they had met, he thought, oh, that's great. He's a, he's a wonderful scholar. Let's keep him there at Princeton, you know. Sure. Uh, but once Wilson was in the White House, everything uh, Wilson did was wrong in Teddy Roosevelt's office. And And unfortunately, Teddy Roosevelt was... You know, they're, they're very happy to tell anybody and in he, speeches. And he did. And he did. And he talked to the press all the time. And he basically thought Wilson was a wuss and, and had really never left the schoolyard. You know, he was, he was a college guy. Um, Wilson, though, uh, proved to be so effective, and I think that rubbed Teddy Roosevelt the wrong way, too. Now, to get to the incident you were talking about when we finally do enter World War I, Basically, uh, Teddy Roosevelt wanted the Rough Riders to ride again, and he wanted to bring back his whole team and, and charge up San Juan Hill or yeah. the, the version in, in Europe, wherever that was going to be. Not going to really work against Krupp's cannons <laughs> yes, well. and, and, and rapid-fire machine guns. Well, and part of what you suggest is true, but I, I give Wilson the benefit of the doubt here that Wilson is now commander-in-chief, and he has to deal with a lot of things, one of which is, do I really want this old soldier now to be mustering his own little army? Yeah. And we're sending them to your, and, and not only that, not only is he an old soldier, but he's also a former commander in chief, a mm -hmm. former president. Very popular. Extremely popular, and how will that be for say, General Pershing, who is going to be heading our right. Armies, our American Expeditionary Force. What's that going to be like when he's trying to get two million men fighting there, and Teddy Roosevelt's getting the headline every day because he's Teddy Roosevelt? Right. He's riding a donkey to try and capture the Kaiser. You know, well, some crazy. well exactly. he's got some crazy some manic scheme, and it's yeah. a stunt. Yeah. You know, and and at the end of the day, Wilson did think Teddy Roosevelt was a blowhard. Yeah. And and enough, you had your chance. And now this is the way we run the government today. And it's a very different means. There's, there's another uh, Roosevelt we got to bring up, which is Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin yeah. Roosevelt is, gets his first big key appointment, Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Exactly right. From Wilson. So, and that really gives him, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, his start. Yep. If you wanted to, you could make the argument, Franklin Roosevelt never becomes president if it's not for Woodrow Wilson? Well, I, uh, I mean, I could argue that, but I mean, certainly this is where his real political career begins, I think. I'm certainly on a national level. Right. It's the first time he's getting national coverage. Uh, he fought very hard for Wilson to get the nomination from the Democratic Party in 1912. He was a great supporter in 1916. He was a huge supporter of everything Wilson did. He really idolized Wilson. He watches Wilson. Um, I can see him almost picking up tricks uh, from Wilson in how to, how to deal with the press, with cabinets and so forth. You know, Wilson was the first president to hold press conferences. Uh, and I can see Roosevelt seeing how Wilson was relating to the people, was relating yeah. to the press. He, he's picking all this stuff up. And indeed, the progressivism. I mean, you know, Wilson had this incredibly successful New freedom, it was called. We haven't been specific about <coughs> that, so I should probably we should probably clarify. Woodrow Wilson is when he when he takes office. There's this again something we're dealing with today. Yeah. There's a one percent of the country that has uh, an incredible amount of power and influence and, and money, money and money. No income tax. Is right. that correct? That's correct. And Woodrow Wilson comes in and single handedly. Uh, tries to and succeeds in getting an income tax and trying to start to build a middle class. And not just an income tax, but a graduated income tax. Uh, call this a redistribution of wealth, if you like, but yeah. this was one in which richer people would pay a greater percentage than poorer people. Right. Uh, he lowered the tariffs. He wanted to get rid of the tariffs because everybody had to pay 
the penny on a pound of sugar. Uh, well, that doesn't mean anything to a rich person, but to a poor person, that extra penny does count. So mm. things like that. The Federal Reserve System was something Wilson brought in. The eight-hour workday, workman's mm -hmm. compensation. Put the first Jew on the Supreme Court. All these things were leveling the playing field in America. Uh, Wilson wasn't anti-rich people, he wasn't anti-big business, but he was anti-unfairness. Yeah. And he wanted everybody to have a shot. And so if you look at everything he did in the New Freedom, or indeed everything he did as a president of Princeton, he really was trying to level things here. So FDR watched all this, and he saw what worked and what didn't work, and I think this was very much in the back of his mind when he became president. Was Wilson fond of Franklin Roosevelt, or did he not really know him that well? A, a little of both. He didn't know him all that well, what he, you know, because he was second tier, he wasn't in the cabinet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what he knew, he liked, uh, and he certainly knew uh, FDR was a great supporter. Yeah. Um, he was... I don't want to call him a lapdog, but he, he really loved everything Woodrow Wilson did. Um, there, there were moments I felt he was being slightly sycophantic, but he was a hard-working guy who wanted to get ahead. There's no question about it. And as a lot of people forget, Franklin Roosevelt ran for vice president on the Democratic ticket in 1920 uh, with Governor Cox of Ohio. And the two of them came to visit the Wilson White House to get Wilson's blessing, if you will. And at this point, Wilson had had his stroke. He was in a wheelchair, covered with blankets. You know, no one saw him for the no, longest time. Nobody saw the president for, for a year and a half, really, uh, except a few people who were invited in. And, and Cox and Roosevelt were invited in. And, and this is just me now, decades later, but I honestly do believe when I see pictures of Franklin Roosevelt and I see pictures of Woodrow Wilson, I am sure once FDR was stricken with polio, I am sure he flashed back to that day he met Wilson at the White House in the wheelchair and just the way Wilson comported himself, the way he tilted his head up and kind of looked straight ahead and... You know, no no plea for sympathy. Just keep going, charge, charge. How to mask a devastating illness. Yeah. It's interesting that, uh, I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, Franklin Roosevelt is the protege to Wilson, and Wilson uh, gives him an example of progressive, being a progressive president, but also how to be completely stricken and hide it from America. Absolutely. Which is, I mean, people... My parents are that generation. People had no idea that, that Franklin Roosevelt, they understood that he had had a problem with polio, but no one thought that he was completely wheelchair Nobody had a clue. Yeah, they really didn't. It was in the backs of people's minds, but people didn't need to you deal with it. didn't see it, it and the press was complicit, which we should talk about. How could Wilson be that sick? I mean, he was uh, today, if Wilson were president today, or uh, if a modern president was stricken, yeah. the devastating stroke that paralyzed his left side, yes, paralyzed his left side, and um, he'd be uh, rushed to the hospital, and he would never go back to the White House. Correct. He'd be relieved of his duties almost immediately. How did they get away with it? Well, a lot of things were at work. First of all, Mrs. Wilson. Um, did the, sec not, the second Mrs. Wilson. The second Mrs. Wilson, yes, did not tweet. You know, there were no Instagrams, so... She tried to tweet, but <laughs> no one had a device yet. <laughs> and, she, yeah. and she just couldn't get it down to 140 characters. That's the problem. You know, she she was, was so wordy. <laughs> Southern. She was Southern. Everything got yeah. stretched, you know. So that was certainly a factor. Um, that media and communication was just very different. Mm -hmm. Also, the way we treated the president was very different. There was a sense of privacy a certain element of that. Uh, also, he had very good relations with the press, so they were inclined to give him whatever distance they needed. Well, uh, but we're talking a year and a half. A year and a half, yeah. And <laughs> virtually unable, for a large chunk of time, he could do no work. That's correct, for a couple of months, really. And his wife would go in, the first lady would go in and, into a room and then come out and say, okay, this is what he wants to do. Nobody knows... What happened was she talking room? to the president or a sock puppet? No one, <laughs> no one knew what was happening yeah. in that room. 
quite right. Um, and indeed, I mean, I, I characterize it in my book as the greatest conspiracy that ever fell upon the White House, yeah. which is the second Mrs. Wilson and a handful of doctors made a decision that they would keep the president's stroke from the world. And for a year and a half, they did pull that off. Uh, and basically, every decision that had to be made, every person who needed to see the president after a few months, had to pass through Mrs. Wilson. Yeah. And she, for all intents and purposes, you know, it's been argued she became the first female president of the United States. But indeed, nobody could get past or, you know, or get to the president without going through her. So it's as, as simple as that and as complicated as that. Also, I should add, the Constitution was different than it is today. We have a 25th Amendment today, which, which defines presidential disability. Uh, back then, in 1919, when he suffered a stroke, uh, that was not the case. Uh, and so one could happily go along. Uh, nowhere was it written what determines when the president is no longer able. And they figured, well, um, he can still talk, he can still think. Uh, they couldn't really measure uh, the emotional oscillation in his life, the mood swings, mm -hmm. whatever was going on. And their concern was his personal constitution, not the United States Constitution. Right. So that being the case, they, you know, the, the doctors told Mrs. Wilson, too much stress will kill your husband. So she said, well, um, then we'll keep all stress from him. Right. And th the way they chose to do it was to have her be the middle person. What's shocking to me is that 1920 rolls around, mm -hmm. Woodrow Wilson is thinking of running again, which is insanity. I mean, he's, you were talking about someone who shouldn't have finished his, yeah. should have been relieved, uh, you know, two thirds of the way through his second term. He's considering running again and waiting to be nominated, hoping he'll be nominated. And if he is nominated, you get the sense that he would run. That he even would. Even though he's desperately ill. That he would run, and he's making lists of cabinet members and things he wants to run on. And this, too, though, see, this is where I think the effects of the stroke are kicking in that we can't measure. I mean, I think there was a touch of madness here. There was a, there was a euphoria, which often accompanies strokes. And I think he was not able to make proper judgments. And mm -hmm. so here, here was an example of it. We haven't talked about also uh, the logical question, which is, did anyone think of calling the vice president? <laughs> you know, which, which might have been a good idea. You think the vice president <laughs> would uh, drop by once in a while and, and poke him with a stick? Or, you know, you well, know, I mean, I got the sense the vice president uh, was not eager to be president. <laughs> yeah. Is that fair to say? That's more than fair. And in fact, uh, the, the, vice the vice president was Thomas R. Marshall of Indiana. Correct. Thomas Riley Nicely Marshall. Done. Indeed. Hey, I wrote the book for 13 years. I know. I got I to come up with the vice president's name. I wanted to quiz you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and he did show up a few times, but Mrs. Wilson wouldn't let him in. That's so funny. <laughs> vice president here, here to see if the president's alive. He's in that room. You can't see him. Well, I'll be going then. It is, it, it is, I mean, it's sad, but there's a comical aspect to it. Well, also. there is. And you have to understand, uh, if you can believe this, the office of the vice president was considered a comical position. Yeah. Uh, especially. Unlike today. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Where we all have the greatest respect for, for Mr. Biden and but, his hard But work. then the vice president really did nothing except wait for the president to die. Yeah. And this was a vice president who did not want the president didn't to die. Because right. he didn't want to be president. Didn't want it, he, yeah. he really didn't. And I, I talked to, well, I talked to, hey, how about this? I talked to Theodore Roosevelt's daughter, mm -hmm. the legendary Alice Roosevelt Longworth. A famous knew, quote from her is, if you don't have something nice to say about anyone, come, come sit, sit by, by me. me. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I want to hear it. Well, she had a few others, which, well, when I knew her in my 20s, and she was in her late 80s. And uh, she, I got into a conversation with her about Marshall, who she claims, so I, I'm sure this is untrue, because it came from her. Uh, <laughs> That's a good way to test any theory. <laughs> What did Alice Rose <laughs> yes, Longworth yes. Roosevelt say? <laughs> it had to be false. But she, she claimed that he had a business card that said Thomas R. Marshall, uh, Vice President of the United States and Toastmaster. 
uh, <laughs> which he loved being. He loved being right. a Toastmaster. Right. And she also told me that when they finally did divulge the secret to the vice president that Wilson had a stroke, that he fainted. Yeah. So, you know, this was a guy who didn't really want the gig. Yeah. That being said, I often ask myself, because these were the same things people said about Harry Truman in 1944 and 45. What if Thomas Marshall had become president? Who knows? If, if the light were on him, who knows that if he wouldn't have become a Harry Truman? Harry Truman is uh, a joke to people when he's vice president. He's totally. ha I think he had one, one or two meetings with Franklin Roosevelt. That's it. He's a so it's the same former thing. failed haberdasher. That and was it. He was the tailor. Yeah, you know, and now and not and now suddenly he's president. And then look what happened, though. So that's a fair question to raise about Thomas R. Marshall. It's a fair question to ask of Edith Wilson and and the doctors. Uh, who's to say what Marshall might have done or not done? The office can change people. Can change people, and who's to say that people might have had such pity for Wilson? They might have said to President Marshall, "You know what? Let's pass that League of Nations." Yeah. Let's do it in Woodrow Wilson's name. Who knows? Woodrow Wilson uh, leaves the White House and in comes his polar opposite. Yeah. Harding. Yes. And Warren Harding is, uh, immediately recognizes and tells anybody who will listen, I'm in way over my head. <laughs> yes. I'm a good poker player. I'm fun at a party. I'm an idiot. Um, I'm, and, pa I'm paraphrasing. N yes, you are, but not by much. But also r immediately revealed himself as f immoral and fairly corrupt. Yeah. With a lot of cronies. And this, suddenly Woodrow Wilson's stock, if it was down a bit when he left office, people wow. start flocking to his house. He has a, a beautiful house. I've actually never been there. I'd like to see you it. You should go there. I want to go great. there. Uh, the great house. People go to his house and flock outside and applaud whenever he comes out to take a ride in his in his, his car. car. Yeah. He's driven around in a beautiful it's a uh, Pierce Arrow. Pierce Arrow. Nineteen nineteen Pierce Arrow. And do they still have the car? The car is actually at the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library in Stanton, Virginia. Uh, oh, it was government property. No, it belonged. He it, bought it. He it bought it. It was from government, government property, but he bought it. Right. Or he had friends who bought it for him because this was before the days of presidential pensions, and a few people, um, and Bernard Baruch among them, said this is a disgrace. So they raised some money privately for the president. Yeah. For Wilson, so it's he a little evocative it. of uh, Ronald Reagan. Very. Ronald much. Reagan had so this, people, powerful had, California businessmen, saying, "Hey." This guy was the president. Let's get him a nice a house. house. Let's get him. Uh, exactly let's set right. him up. His his retirement, if you can call it that. He's sick. He's living in this home. But I was surprised too when I read your book that his retirement. He lives for a few years. I always thought of him as this figure that it's very tragic. He's off on this noble quest. He falls sick. He leaves office and then fades into darkness. Yeah. And I read your book. He's. Um, being driven around uh, in this beautiful Pierce Arrow uh, and watching a lot of movies. He loves the movies Love and they're it. screened for him. He loves the movie stars, he loves yep. all, he watches pretty much every movie he can get his hands on. Every one, uh, and yes, and he runs out of them ultimately. And he goes to the theater all the time. He loves vaudeville, he loves vaudeville. Mm -hmm. I mean, he goes to the vaudeville theater once or twice a week, even when he's president. When he's president, in the best of health, he would sometimes hop on a train and go up to New York to see a show. Yeah. You know, this is a guy who loved theater, he loved movies. Yeah, there's uh, a sweet scene that you describe where he's watching the, he's ill and he's uh, in retirement yeah. and he's watching some show and all the actors come out and greet him and I mean, he's loved, he's, he's beloved. He is truly beloved. Yeah, that's when he goes to the, to the vaudeville theater and, and they would all turn out. Uh, I mean, the actors would go on stage and just acknowledge his presence, calling him the greatest soldier of all. You know? yeah. And then they would all flock to his limousine in the alley afterwards as he's leaving to go back. And as you said, they would turn out to see him you know, take his, his afternoon drive every day. Mm -hmm. And then on occasions, like Armistice Day, November 11th, uh, each year there'd be a thousand people. The next year there'd be ten thousand people. The next year twenty thousand people gathering yeah. out to, just to get it's a powerful. glimpse. Powerful. He's a he is a rock star here, and he became this great icon of, 
Well, of idealism, of peace, of freedom, all, the, all those things. And, and that's why I think part of the legend lives on. And, you know, yeah. that's, that's the good aspect of Woodrow Wilson that, that wants examination, re-examination. The um, stepping back and looking at the, the bigger picture, he's, uh, he's right. He's very right about a few things. He makes it very clear at Versailles to the European leaders, you're being too tough mm -hmm. on the Germans. Mm -hmm. you, and if you extract these kind of penalties from them, you're going to cripple them as a country and it's gonna come back to bite you in the ass exactly what happens and you get World War II. And he said in 25 years, the same countries will all go to war. Get your calendars out. Yeah. I mean, put an X on Tuesday, he, he, he got it. Yeah, he understood that, uh, and, and there was no talking to the French, the British, they were so mad about that war and everybody had this, it becomes absurd, you're reading about how everyone's, they have accountants trying to figure out what a human life is worth and then they're, they're handing a bill to Germany yeah. and saying you owe us, I, I don't even know what the numbers are or what they would be today, but you know what, uh, you owe us you know, hundreds of billions of dollars yeah. in, in gold to pay us, which is an absurd idea. Uh, you can't, mm -hmm. there's no, it was a tragedy all around for everybody. Well, it was. And of course, the, the rap that Wilson often takes is that he was too hard on Germany, too onerous, the bill yeah. was too great, um, and that that is what led to World War II. In truth, the bill that Germany was handed was something they could deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, and in further truth, the Germans never paid it. Right. <laughs> so that ultimately isn't the reason they went to war again. But Wilson did understand that about beating them down. This again goes back to his childhood, remembering the Reconstru Civil War. Reconstruction. It, exactly right. right. And he knew the toll it was going to exact a generation or two later. To humiliate your enemy. They will, they will come back. They will. They have to. Just human nature. The other thing that, and this is, the, this is a, just a much bigger question that relates to where we are today, is um, it's a thought that's a, you know, been brought up by other people and it's occurred to me a few times, is Barack Obama and Woodrow Wilson and possible parallels between the two both academics, mm -hmm. both very rapid rise yes. to uh, very rapid rise to an office, to the office of the presidency. Both of them, uh, you could say idealistic mm -hmm. as a positive and maybe even potentially, potentially as a negative. That Woodrow Wilson had a big idea, which was his, uh, his 14 points, you know, yep. his, League his, his League yep. of Nations. And Obama has a big idea, which is uh, uh, health care, universal health coverage, and both very married to an idea. Yes. And it's their rise and also potentially their fall. Is that, is there, do you think there's a parallel there at all? Well, I think there, yes, I think there are um, every parallel you've just named. I would also add that they were both great orators. Mm -hmm. I mean, Woodrow Wilson was the greatest orator of, of his day and is in fact the last president who wrote all of his own speeches. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was just a, an incredible wordsmith as well as a great talker. He had written how many books before he was even He'd president? written a dozen books. A dozen books, and he was well-known, famous uh, as, as a historian. He was, it, it's almost as though Arthur Schlesinger ran for the presidency you right. know, and got elected right. in an electoral landslide. So that's who Woodrow Wilson was. I mean, he was our most, I, was, I won't say he was our greatest intellectual, but he was among our most famous intellectuals right. when he ran for president in, in 1912. So there's, there's that parallel that he and Barack Obama are also very persuasive when they speak. So they have that. Um, I would say um, Wilson, I think strangely, because he was more of an academician, uh, really knew how to play the game a little better. Uh, at least he worked the Congress. He, he knew how to massage them. He knew how to elbow them. Um, Obama, I'm not sure that's the case. And yet, I think, I think you know, he's already got his health care thing passed. The Supreme Court has passed on it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, he's up against opposition, the likes of which 
who could imagine? It's just relentless. So my money's on Barack Obama on this. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways that's highly Wilsonian. And I think Obama, he reminds me of Wilson a great deal, a great deal. Well, it's also, I, I remember when, I think one of the first times that Obama went to Europe, and I, I actually thought about Wilson, because not, he goes to since, Europe yeah. and there is a level of, I mean, the- There's mania. The, yeah, and also the, the Nobel Peace Prize. Nobel you know, Peace Prize, exactly. too, uh, too soon into his presidency, um, uh, there's, a, there's a, a treatment overseas that, and then you come back home to the reality, which is the exactly. same thing that happened with Woodrow Wilson. I think Barack Precisely. Obama, I'm a god when I'm in Europe, and then I yeah. come home. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know <laughs> how they treat me? Yeah. <laughs> when I'm in Prague, they go crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. but yeah, then you're you're hustling for votes in uh, in in South yeah. Carolina. Yeah. yeah. Exactly right. So great great similarities. No no question about it. Um, no, they. They remind me a great deal of each other. Is it possible, um, I was talking about with a, with a good friend of mine who has the, loves the same subject and we were talking about this and he said, we got into this argument and I'm not sure what the answer is and maybe, maybe you have an idea. Is it possible that America, the American people are uncomfortable with a president who's got a big grand idea? Uh, that they are more comfortable <laughs> Franklin Roosevelt is always shucking and jiving, bobbing and weaving. Uh, same with John F. Kennedy. They don't marry everything to one idea. They'll move, they'll change their position. Woodrow Wilson and Barack Obama will plant their feet, proclaim a big idea, and stand by it. Maybe sometimes to the discomfort of the American people. It might be something inherently we're not sure we want. Yeah, I think, I think Americans are not by nature a philosophical people. We don't necessarily want the big concept. We want specifics. We, we like things to work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if... Even so, if it's the, so if Obama's yeah. Uh, yeah, website, healthcare website just worked, that would mean more to us than... Uh, it, than the healthcare than, idea. Than the philosophical <laughs> notion, yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think there, there is genuine truth to that, though. And... And Wilson was truly a man of ideas. He would tell you also a man of ideals. You know, and then we've had other presidents, you know, who say, do you want me to talk about the vision thing? I mean, a lot of presidents just don't have the vision and don't like talking about the vision right, thing. Right, makes them uncomfortable. And they think it's hokey. They do. Wilson was so comfortable talking about that. And he was so comfortable he could convince the people. People bought into it. Mm -hmm. and I think in large measure, people bought into Roosevelt's visions as well. And, uh, and I would say Ronald Reagan was a man of vision. Yeah. Um, and, and so it is effective, but you, but you need the specific programs to back it up and you need them to work. <laughs> so that's, an, uh, that's another thing. Um, and Wilson's did work, so that really helped him a lot. I mean, he, uh, he came in not just with this agenda, but he got it passed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was just one measure after another. It was just unbelievable. Which have changed, really changed the, uh, the nature of our country. Well, certainly changed, well, domestically, economically. And set up things that Franklin Roosevelt will do, that then later on Lyndon Johnson will do, that then later on Precisely. Barack Obama will do. So it's a, it's a... There's definitely a progression. I think it really does go back to Woodrow Wilson. And indeed, in foreign policy, and this, this is either a really good thing or a really bad thing, but all American foreign policy to this minute goes back to Woodrow Wilson leading us into World War I when he gave a speech in April of 1917 and said, the world must be made safe for democracy. Mm -hmm. And again, whether you approve of that or not, or like it or not, it doesn't matter. It is the bedrock on which all American foreign policy is built. What's well, in, in one sentence, we went from, that's not us, we stay here. We're isolationists. We're isolationists right? to we no, are No somehow, foreign entanglements. We're responsible. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's George and, Washington who says, let us not get entangled, that's the whole key. Exactly. But he meant for a period of time, until we're strong enough. And Wilson reacted to that saying, but we are entangled. Don't you see the world's changed? It's gotten smaller, communication, transportation. Right. It's shrunk the world. What happens in Indiana is felt in India, you know, I mean, so these things happen. And, and Wilson's feeling was, okay, now that we are entangled, how are we going to deal with this? Right. 
And this was the way he felt it should be. And again, this goes back to his religiosity. He felt there should be a moral component yeah. to our policy because he felt there should be a moral component to who Americans were mm -hmm. and now are. Now we are. We have a question from the, uh, we have an internet question. And this is at Shadow of Krypton from Twitter. <laughs> yes, that's the kind of show you're on. <laughs> I <have no> idea. <laughs> at Shadow of Krypton asks, who do you think was the most influential president? That's a pretty, that's a broad brush, but you want to take a stab at it? <laughs> well, I feel Wilson was of the 20th century anyway. Mm -hmm. I think we have to say Washington yes. certainly was because he gets the whole thing rolling and the way he gets it rolling mm -hmm. and the way he deals with the presidency. And then I think you have to jump to Lincoln mm -hmm. as a president uh, basically for the efforts to bring the, to keep the country together and then to bring it together. So um, I also think I always I, I always think that Lincoln's greatest gift might have been he's he was our best writer. He, he just uh, just I, th I think that's true. Too. Just he's a he's a poet. Yeah. His actual poetry that he wrote is terrible, but he's a, but his whose isn't? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, but his, his, his prose his, was, his words just, you know, I, I was at an event recently and, um, someone read the Gettysburg Address and I'm crying it's, and it's, uh, it's good writing. Yeah. Uh, and I wouldn't dismiss Thomas Jefferson as, as a writer. No. Um, you know, I mean, we've had some really amazing thinkers and writers in the White House, many more who were not. Um, and many more who simply didn't write. Yeah. Um, and as I suggested, Wilson is the last uh, to write all his own material, um, including some magnificent speeches. And not only did he write them, uh, he was the best stenographer in the White House. He learned shorthand when he was a teenager. So he would write the first drafts in shorthand, and then he'd sit at a typewriter and type them up himself. And yeah, It's just crazy to think of a president. <laughs> Mr. President, hold on. You know, I'll be there in a minute. I'm I'm finishing the speech that that will change the world. Yeah, that will change the world. <laughs> but we're, we're so divorced from the idea that someone would write their own speech. But he he literally did, though. Yeah. I mean, I mean, these major speeches and most of his speeches he didn't write. He was such an incredible extemporaneous speaker. He would go out to campaign with a note card with five bullet points on it, mm -hmm. and he could talk for an hour and a half. Right. And somebody would then transcribe it, and well, I've gone through the transcriptions. There's not a word out of place. There's not a, a syntactical error. There's not a paragraph that doesn't follow its predecessor. He was just, he was magical, really magical. And he had a wonderful voice. Well, you've done a great job. I have to tell you, I'm, I, I, Thank you. I, you, uh, when I saw that this book was coming out, I was excited to read it. And uh, you've really changed my thinking a lot about, about Wilson. I don't know. I don't know where I put him in the in the list yet. I still Lincoln's number one for me, um, deservedly. And then Chester A. Arthur, of course. <laughs> Van Buren. Um, don't forget Fillmore. Fillmore, second George Bush. I have my own list. <laughs> yes. Uh, which may not co correspond to your list at home. <laughs> I like saying at home. Yeah. You know, we're on the internet. <laughs> You're probably in a, <laughs> I don't know where the hell you're watching this. Uh, this a was Starbucks. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is this was really fun for me. I, I hope that uh, Actually, if too. you've had half as much fun uh, as I've had, then I've been a terrible host. Um, oh. But thank you so much. Thank you. I've yeah, had, really. I've had half as much. Great. Yeah. <laughs> thanks so much for doing this. And thank the book you. is uh, is Wilson A. Scott Berg, and uh, you should get this book. It's fantastic. And this is Conan O'Brien. This has been another serious jibber-jabber. Do I say anything at the end? I can't remember. Like, uh, press Control-Alt-7 uh, and stay away from the pornography because it's fun but ultimately damaging. Ooh. Peace out. I think I did. There's pornography on the Internet? I don't want you to know about that. No, do you, do you, how, do you, how do you access it? No, 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 no. You don't want to know about this. You've got work to do. Huh. You cannot be watching.